can't steer the, their dollars into one direction or another. So the foundation can invest in these funds where the fund managers will be providing diligence on the companies, whether or not they're meeting their milestones or whatnot. Or they could, if they wanted to, invest directly in a company. They just haven't because they honestly they don't have the staff mm -hmm. to look at hundreds of companies to make one investment. Um, so that that is new. And then um, we have had um, in our for years now in our stock purchase agreements or shareholder agreements with these startup companies, the um, pro rata right to invest in um, ten, up to ten percent of every round of financing. Our problem has been. <laughs> Even we take such small amounts, three to five percent of a startup um, when they raise their first qualified round of financing. That it, if UC doesn't exercise those rights, of course we're diluted way down so that when there is an equity realization event, acquisition of the startup or IPO, we now have 0.02 or 0.05 percent. So it really doesn't amount to much. And we're working on you know, what we should do about that. But um, in reality, the university um, chief investment officer and former treasurer were focused on the huge California endowment, including the retirement system. And so all of this was just noise and not really on their radar. But um, people are more interested, and especially with these new campus-focused, campus-facing funds on that category of rights, because um, it benefits the <coughs> campus as a whole and not just one program. I also didn't mention the uh, lab to market programs that are trying to bridge um, the gap when it's just not certain if there is a startup company that will pop out of a given lab, um, simply because it's still so academic that no one knows. And so um, these programs are run by the School of Business and um, a business school student and a representative from a company and a PhD student will form a team to work on one project to do hours and hours of market research to see what it could be or what has to be done next. So some of these, um, some of this information is useful for inward facing purposes because the professor will now know, you know, I probably should uh, submit a grant now to do this or they'll say, uh, you know, it really is time to um, think about a startup and let this leave the university. Um, but I, we do think we need more um, such lab to market programs, especially in the medical devices area. Did you have questions that? Question regarding the. the Question regarding the fund uh, that you were describing, because it's really interesting. You're saying half the carry uh, gets sort of donated mm -hmm. back, so to speak. But given that professional fund managers are driven by their carry, right? Yeah. So half of it there just went that way. The remaining half, how does that get split? And is there enough to drive them to, right. to incentivize them? It, it'll go back to the program that they're supporting too. Um, and the, um, absolutely, the, um, Limited partners will be paid off first, and so they're really carrying the they're sharing the GP portion. But it's just simply that um, many former entrepreneurs want to give back in many ways, including this way, um, and they can um, at least start this way, even if they don't run every successive fund in this manner. They're forging a new path and doing something new, at least with the first fund. And one a very a separate question that I'm really curious to ask you. There's a, there's a pain point or a challenge that we experience here, and I, I'm pretty sure you experience over there and around the world. When dealing with a very um, deep tech team, especially research driven, uh, there's a challenge of um, helping them become more entrepreneurial and commercializable as, as a team, right? And I think various people have tried to crack this a couple of different ways. One is to turn researchers or technical people into entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Another is to match make and bring business folks, so to quote unquote, and then slam them together. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Both of which seem to be really, really challenging. Have you encountered some right. best practices or you know, yeah. ways to crack this? We discussed in the previous section that often, uh, you know, a career academic is 
the least likely to make a successful transition into a company where it's all about teamwork and collaboration because we were trained differently to be you know, competitive. And it's just some personality types too. But um, the best people, the people who make the transition the best are the ones that listen to the earliest feedback normally from angel investors who are giving smart money and babysitting their investments, meeting with those teams every week. It's really, it's free mentorship, yes. and they, they should listen intently <laughs> to them because um, we see so many people saying, well, despite all the advice I'm getting <laughs> and the seed funding of 500 to, to, to 500,000, uh, I still won't do that, <laughs> and it, it, it might not work. But we do have um, programs, including the Innovation i which is funded by the National Science Foundation, to teach companies um, and the entrepreneur, well, the entrepreneurs to um, engage in customer discovery and then get out of the startup and interview people and don't sit there to try to write a 100-page business plan. You do all this first because you might, might have made an assumption that's just not right. Uh, this is not going to be an FDA approval process, but you probably have a service business here or something like that. And so um, these programs, um, the entrepreneurship training programs are um, they are to teach these companies to pivot, just as our office has pivoted. They have to, and that's, that's a sign of success when they realize they should change direction. One problem with us is that we pivoted through these business models to provide services to the campus, but we can't abandon the previous model. We have to keep all the previous models <laughs> financed, and that's, that's difficult. Uh, the, um, we are also taking equity um, in exchange for rent in some of our physical spaces. So for the hard tech, um, or all the big machinery is in the basement of um, engineering, um, a raw startup with maybe one or two employees can have access in exchange for 2%. And um, our office will also take 2 to 5% in a license. And by the way, our license is posted online the Ipera website, um, and um, EIRs, Entrepreneurs and Residents, are not retained by our office, but we give them office space, we, we introduce them to startups, knowing that they too are going to be really valuable mentors. Um, they're not working for the university, but they're helping these companies just because they're probably going to go with one or more. But um, if it's just chemistry, you know, people are just not working well together. Um, I don't see things happening until um, if the company does well and they're going to get venture capital investment, uh, the board and the VC are going to kick someone out. I <laughs> uh, just wanted to ask that in, <clears throat> actually in university, probably you have a lot of inventors that create technology, whether it's a deep tech or not deep tech. But then you, you probably be the one who uh, prioritize which one should go for commercialization, for which one first. You have a lot. You need to have layers of that. Uh, do you have any insight to tell us how you do that? We haven't been able to um, have a crystal ball and figure out what will be successful, so we rely on companies if they're going to invest. But as I said, we invested in IP not knowing who would license it um, to find many years later that um, they should have had a license because the technology did work. Um, we uh, know in general which fields are being um, invested in when they are startup companies because for some reason many of the venture capital companies keep making the same types of investment as each other. There are very few that are contrarian. But when we're going to license to a, another company, a um, small, medium, or large company, we rarely can tell even sometimes what the product is. Is that getting to your question or was it your question different? Well, the, probably that you are the one who are having a lot of inventions and then mm -hmm. you just let some people to market my fishing around from that but mm -hmm. then I have to ask you another question to separate me if you if you've been given uh, a product 
a technology to, to one of the VC or something like that. And actually, the, the VC probably matching with some entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who are running that. And then the, the project is failed. The technology is coming back to your university or still with the, well, whatever. Um, all, all the, all the, mm -hmm. uh, all the CV who how going to resell the technology again to others for that. Yeah, we rarely get anything that is uh, fully developed as a product back. Um, even if we have to terminate a license because the licensee is um, not paying <coughs> costs or something like that, um, generally it will not come back to us because we really do only want to be doing um, academically appropriate research, even though it might be somewhat applied, it's still research appropriate for a student to do. Um, an exception would be in the incubators and accelerators where some of our money might get mixed in in a particular way, but um, those uh, facilities are by and for startups, which are absolutely distinct from the university. It's interesting that we were have been asked um, to find a team and put a team around a concept and then spin it out because people are interested in spinning out in Northern California. And even then, when someone gives us a good idea, uh, we feel like it should have been our technology that we put our resources into. Um, but on the other hand, what's wrong with making an idea bank? You know, like someone said, find me some new wearable tech um, and, and or something else that's not fit bit. Um, we should keep it in mind, even though we're, we're not going to make an investment in actually putting the team together because we're constrained in how much equity we can take in a company, but it's, it's just good for us to um, put these things somewhere where we can find them because we have global opportunities to uh, contribute to someone else's product. We might have a little piece of something that we find elsewhere to put together in one ball of wax. one behind you. Hi, Doctor. Um, I don't know if you know, the first question was asked by a golden bear. Did he tell you that? Yes, he did. Uh, I'm, I'm a duck. Very yeah. a long bear. time ago. In fact, I'm a dinosaur in this industry. And okay. A, a question would be back in the early 70s when we were doing our startups and all those kind of things in our garages. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd, we'd go to school, we'd learn something um, a little, and we'd come out and we do our own thing, right? We would have never thought to affiliate with our university or any university, right? And, you know, I, I guess my question is, what's the leakage from your school? The, those that, that are in school, they come out, uh, they have the idea, maybe they developed it in, your, in the school or whatever. They come out and they get it with a few friends and they start their idea and the first three fail and then they hit the big one or whatever it is. Um, how many of those don't you see and get the revenues from? Most. Most of the ones that we see are uh, abs have absolutely used federal grants and gifts and other forms of funding and laboratories and specialized equipment. <laughs> you know, most software just goes out. I mean, I would say we're the front door. I, I don't know how many go out the back door, but we don't chase after someone to say, you know, you should have come through me only. And many uh, projects are, um, have students who have no legal obligation to us because they're paying us tuition. Graduate students are different because they're getting paid as a teaching fellow, so they're an employee. But even then, you know, in the whole area of copyright, we are not um, ma making you see the owner of most code. <laughs> and, and even if those other um, software rights aren't going out through a Berkeley software distribution license or the MIT license or otherwise uh, freely, we're still not managing most of it. Now, there is a movement afoot across the US to just give such a, a fast license to software that for someone who might have a guilty conscience or might worry that we would run after them, um, they could just sign that and be done with it because they might simply be worrying that when it time, comes time to get significant funding, people will ask, you know, was UC supposed to own, have title to this? 
And so uh, we will work on that because it'll just be another tool. But um, in the end, if things get out, um, <laughs> they're, still, they're still getting out. Um, we, are, we also can't force someone to patent something if they don't want to participate in the process. I mean, um, I know at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, I said we have 600 joint appointees between the campus and the lab. They vet um, publications before they actually are printed to see if there are inventions in there. And they can, though they rarely do, tell someone, you know, do you know, do you have an invention you need to disclose to me? But how um, are you going to make someone participate in such an arduous process if they don't want to? Yeah. Even though they have the, the right to do that. So uh, we might be missing out on entire categories of things, but in the end, if um, there's some benefit to the local economy and some benefit to California, like, what's wrong with that? Also, anything that takes too long, you know, is just uh, also a speed bump on a particular road. And, and there are other ways of monetizing things. There is something now called the Berkeley Pledge. So if you don't have a license from us, but you still get into one of our programs, the educational programs or one of the um, physical spaces, and you sign it, it's very soft. It's not a contract that anyone would be sued over. It's just um, don't forget, uh, don't forget Cal if you do well, you know, and um, make, think about giving a gift. Um, and it's not as though, you know, I found out that you did something that you were supposed to work um, through our office. Uh, it's much softer than that, but it's just a reminder. And I spent a huge amount of time um, bringing in gifts from industry to Cal because it's all good for research at Cal. Does that answer? Yeah, I, you know, in the end, in my opinion, your best friend should be your one associate. Absolutely. And that's actually what these campus-facing funds have done. They're partnering with the foundation. We got the data from the last six slides that I showed about entrepreneurs of all stripes, not just in the STEM fields, but everyone who is, let's just say, a solo practitioner, you know, went to law school and they didn't join a firm, and so they hung out the shingle and they are an entrepreneur. Everyone was in there, and uh, those data came from the Alumni Association. And it was only those people who responded to a poll. So it's probably 10% of all the alumni that started companies. And that number was 2,300. <laughs> Hello, doctor. Thank you for sharing your insights. They're very helpful. Um, could we touch upon your uh, triple helix you mentioned? Oh, yeah. Um, shed a little more insight into how the coordination between university, government, and corporation is working, um, what are the checkpoints, and so who takes the lead, and yeah. how do you decide on agenda and priorities? That's, that started when um, it was clear that people were having trouble getting federal grants, and it's been more than a decade since the pay lines, at least for NIH, were going lower and lower. At one point, 8% of applicants were getting grants. So professors were coming to us um, saying, you know, how where can we get money for this great project? So we said, well, uh, my office doesn't sign the foundation agreements, but we have relationships with, it, with foundations. We'll see which foundations might be interested, and we'll see which uh, companies might be interested. But we might have to advance this a little more for anyone to fund it. So we realized we needed to get uh, what I think of as sandboxes together, where we um, usually off campus will put, um, just define a specific goal. And uh, it's, it might be possible to, um, we might need materials or IP from industry, and then the professors' ideas and students working on something. And then we might need more money um, that doesn't come only to the university, but into this sandbox. The whole goal of the sandbox is to define um, a period of time in which you'll get to point B, because you're all combining assets, including IP, um, to get from A to B, and you also sign a um, non—well, you sign a 
non-assert agreement. You won't sue each other while you're playing nicely together in the sandbox. But once you get to point B, the whole plan is for the, the lab to go back inside of Cal, the companies to go back into the private sector, but they were chosen so that they're not direct competitors to begin with. It's just that they have useful tools to put together. Um, once you're at the second generation and you have the improvements, everyone has access to the new IP and everyone um, goes home happy, but you together advance something that um, is more than what you would have had you not come together. But then also um, through the initiative where we have so many professors that just want to work on these diseases that affect so many, um, they're neglected tropical diseases, but there is no profit driver for traditional pharmaceutical companies. You just have to be creative. You have to find friends uh, and funding sources for up to seven years to get from point A to point B and then agreements um, that require a large for-profit company at the end of the day to find enough incentives to um, not make a profit in the target countries while making a profit in another. Did, is this the group that I described the malaria project to? I don't remember, but um, that's the semi-synthetic artemisinin project involved um, starting a company with five postdocs from a given lab to perfect this platform technology to make isoprenes or terpenes and anything else you can make from these subunits. And um, one of them is uh, artemisinic acid for making semi-synthetic artemisinin for malaria treatments. But the company that did this, the startup company, um, while they're just breaking even on the malaria project, can make money on flavors and fragrances in emollients or jet fuels or um, anything else that you can make um, from terpenes. So with money from a foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the startup company right off the bat had $12 million and our lab had $8 million. The whole point was to um, prove the technology, platform technology for one indication, malaria, but then let the for-profit startup just run and explore all of these other for-profit models. And, and what biotechnology company doesn't lose money in the first three years anyway? There's no skin off their back to commit to not make a profit on the malaria project because they had to do the R&D anyway. So they were doing the R&D to um, find out how to engineer the yeast to make a particular product through traditional um, fermentation biotechno with, uh, in biotechnology. Um, the government industry university foundation quadruple <laughs> helices have been necessary for anything that's just so hard to get out because there aren't traditional profit drivers for the private sector. And um, they're simply necessary because people need money for research wherever they can get it. And uh, we have to prove that we're a good partner by showing that we can do agreements creatively or put together deals that um, don't just benefit us and then still help the world. So that inventor, Jay Kiesling, said, what, what's wrong with you know doing something if, um, it's just great if you can do science as usual, but then you get to save millions of lives that project actually ended up with a low cost malaria treatment that stabilizes the world supply of um, artemisinic acid and le lessens the dependency on the botanical source, which is grown in um, China and Africa. And, and that source has been unstable traditionally. The Gates Foundation actually donated, or gave 42.6 million for that project. Thank, thank you. And if I could ask one other question about the regional economic cooperation you mentioned, which might be relevant to or helpful to Thai University. How would the Shenzhen project take place in the, uh, the collaboration? I think you mentioned it might be going to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, how's that instigated and uh, the touch points? And yeah. how do you see further uh, interest in other uh, locations? Yeah, usually it's you know a dean and one or more professors who are the um, internal champions. And um, we had 
before that, um, collaborated in Singapore with the CREATE Center in order to get money from the NRF, National Research Foundation. We actually didn't know that we could get a grant from the Singaporean NRF. That's, our NIH wouldn't give NUS and NTU a grant. Um, so once we saw you know, that we could do that, then um, the Department of Engineering said, well, look at all these projects that we can work on that are relevant to what we're doing here. If we're working on um, energy efficient building materials, you know, um, glass or um, whatever else, uh, that would be more efficient than what we do, then why not try to do that in the tropics? You know how cold it is in Northern California. So uh, this will be a really good test bed. Or um, something that someone is working on having to do with irrigation in California. You know, then they have similar projects uh, they can do for proof of principle pertaining to Malaysia and Singapore. So there, there simply were existing projects that seemed um, very interesting um, to do elsewhere because the conditions are different. So with that experience, then when the Shenzhen uh, opportunity came about, uh, again, Shenzhen donated or invested in the entire operation, including the building. Uh, our people can um, have access to those research facilities. Students can come to Berkeley. Um, eventually, a, um, Degrees can be um, given by Tsinghua, Berkeley, Shenzhen Research Institute, or TBSI. Um, and the projects are for the benefit of Shenzhen. Technology transfer will prefer Shenzhen as the uh, point of commercialization. So uh, some of the money also from that project is coming, 20% is coming and has come to Berkeley for use in Berkeley. Um, what else about that? Unlike Singapore, where we created a corporate entity that is solely owned by the UC Regents, in Shenzhen it's jointly owned with Tsinghua. But you know, deans of engineering are so creative. And they have faculty that, and all of the faculty just want to see something come of their technologies. They want to see impact, including global impact. And we have always had students from everywhere. You mentioned um, that uh, Berkeley is interested in uh, pay equity uh, mm -hmm. when uh, startups take the, uh, the invention of the technology, right? Um, how does the university think about? Um, Sorry, OK. Um, you mentioned earlier that the university likes to take equity um, when licensing the invention to startups. How do you think about um, how much equity um, you want to take and how you deal with that in subsequent rounds? Yeah, we take equity in startups because they're cash poor. They really can't afford um, to pay high fees, nor, nor should they. Um, and they're willing to give equity. So it would rarely be more than 5% of their first qualified round of financing. And how, how, and how do you see that in the subsequent rounds for? We generally get a co-investment right or pro rata right. We always try for 10% participation in every round of financing. And uh, some companies view it as, well, what's wrong if I can list you know, the University of California Regents as a potential investor in my company? Others have so much investment and we're almost the last to know about that deal that we can't get those rights so we will never kill a deal because we can't get <coughs> pro rata co-investment rights um, it's just a way for us to participate in the upside if the company does well and uh, i don't know if you know but the university of california as a public institution sells formulaically so if there is an ipo for acquisition and generally under Rule 144 of the Securities and Exchange Commission, we can sell six months after that event. We will nevertheless sell only 50% then, 25% six months later, and the final 20% after that. And the whole reason is, not, is um, that we do have inside information. You know, the 10 campuses, especially the licensing offices, are visiting these companies 
we um, and then with these campus facing funds to see if how the CEO is doing or if they've met this or that milestone it crosses the line to being something that uh, the general public doesn't know so to avoid the allegation that we sold on a given day because we knew something if they just follow this formulaic selling UC can never be used of uh, accused of inside information and proper trading on the other hand you know could um, we do better could we get more if it were actively managed probably I don't know any public universities that do that uh, sorry private universities I mentioned this is I don't think I mentioned in this group that because we're taking equity in lieu of rent in some of the incubators or accelerators and sometimes it's two percent and then my office will want two to five percent in a license it adds up and we don't want it to be a disincentive to the startup so we really need to do something centrally to pool it so that uh, the last unit that takes equity um, isn't penalized and again, it should all be whatever the startups need. We should be as helpful as we can to a startup. But that hasn't been solved so far. Also, I don't know if you know, also UC has a policy that we can't own more than 10% of a company. And that's system-wide. So if UCLA is doing a deal with that same startup because they also need IP there, um, the chief investment officer has to keep an eye on that. But it, we would rarely get so much equity that we end up with more than 10% of a startup after, um, after investment. How do you manage your equity? Um, I don't come from the university. So. How do the universities organize your angel investors? Uh, the angels came to us and they said, um, you need to organize the angels. I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, we can't be sitting at one of your events and then the first medical device doesn't come up until 2 p.m. Especially since I have to drive here and it takes an hour and a half. Um, so we put together a website called pitch.berkeley.edu, and it's a, just a video. Of every pitch that has already been videotaped uh, is on that site. And because we take it down from um, YouTube, it's already there. We're not violating anything, and it's already public. Um, and so with that website, a given investor can search only on medical devices, and they will see which ones satisfy that criterion and they can also see importantly who is pitching and if they like that person um, because they're investing in people so I think that has helped uh, we've simply noticed that um, traditional venture capital is going uh, later and later in the investment especially in biotech so um, the angels are just so valuable not just with the funding but the mentorship their participation in so many of the programs and they just do it because they love it and they, they themselves you know, were entrepreneurs and they want to give back and it's just fun to be around the young people so maybe to partly answer your question so so I'm from Bangkok Venture Club yes. uh, <laughs> co-founder well, there is too so we're we're the largest <coughs> angel group here and we also represent uh, VCs and CVCs so we show up at these university pitches mm -hmm. all the time and mentor and just as you describe our our members are driven by this um, passion and desire to, to help and to engage yeah. um, but there but what you describe there's not so much a formal system so we, we need to kind of show up at these mm -hmm. at, at these pitches we aggregate them and then curate and vet them and bring them to our to our members for pitching we did worry that putting these online <laughs> Um, people then would say, well, why do I have to go in person? But no one believes it's better to just look online than to be there in person. Right. So uh, it just helps people who, who couldn't be there on that day. And, and there are so many pitch up days now. They really can't keep track. Right there. 
could, could I ask her one thing about the detrimental soil, probably along with you, that if you have is a venture, yeah, uh, you listen to all the pitchings and all sort of thing, and how you judge whether that technology would meet your kind of investment like lighting. And you are judging on the technology itself, or you are judging on the researchers, or or you need the, the column tour from the university or something like that, or any other part of the government funding agency or something like that to to uh, consider whether they are potential. I, I just sort of out of consideration just for, for time, so I don't want to give a long answer. But uh, well, but, but just very briefly. It's good to learn from you because hardly to yeah. see your people. Yes, so I'll try to give you a, a, a very, very brief version and happy to talk afterwards. Um, but uh, there's no sense of this sort of guarantee from anyone or anything like that. And also, we represent hundreds of investors, hundreds of angels, VC, CBC. So we're looking at a collective view and we're not making a, an investment decision on their behalf. Do you have any other but, the, very but yes, but yes, the criteria are the standard criteria that most venture capitalists look at. So one, it needs to be quote unquote VC fundable. It has to do with the market potential market size, scalability, the value proposition, the traction, uh, particularly <coughs> relative to the ask or the funding that's being raised, um, the, uh, the sort of uh, defensibility, uh, the team, which every investor looks at. And, and I was glad to hear the way you described earlier about uh, coachability and that kind of So it's pretty much a standard set of criteria that I think almost any, any investor looks at, and we're not so specific to an investment thesis. Do you have anything to add on? So if a startup can't find any money at all, are you coaching them on what they could pivot to? That's something that we're kind of proud of. Like, So when we bring in these startups, um, even if they're not ready to go to our full member base, our committee members love sharing um, and, and mentoring and coaching on the side. Uh, as much as we can, um, so so yes. Did you know that the um, Berkeley Sky Deck Accelerator has over a hundred mentors? No, I didn't. Um, they, and they they are people who are generally seed funding, seed funders, and mentors. Um, and any company that is accepted now will get a hundred thousand dollars from the Sky Deck Fund, one of these external but campus-facing. Wow, that's great. Yeah, we, we may not have the resource to do something like that quite yet, but. <laughs> Why Combinator, which is probably